Yes. <clears throat> I think, you know, web webcams and, and webinars just become so ordinary now, you know, they're nothing, it's just the way we do things these days, it's really quite a, a, it's a big shift from where we were in the past. Um, and lots of teachers I know who previously would have never even contemplated going anywhere near a webinar or, or, or even starting one or leading one, now it's just like water off a duck's back, you know, it's just... That's just the kind of things we do at work, and um, who knows what the next few months will bring. I hope we, we manage to get through it and not have to do, we still get to do in-person teaching and stuff like that, um, rather than looking at a screen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody who's already here. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we'll get started in another minute. Or so, we'll give a, 30, um, a 60 second countdown and then we can get started on, on looking at amazing things in PowerPoint. Who knew you were going to be coming to see an amazing things in PowerPoint? A, a piece of software that's been around for so long and is so widely used. And I remember the first time I used it, you know, it was, it was like, this is amazing, you know. <laughs> and then it just becomes like like webinars, it just becomes an ordinary, everyday part of what you do. So you, it kind of loses its luster. Um, but over the last few years, I know Microsoft have spent an awful lot of time trying to make sure that product is is really fit for purpose and really doing some great things for, for um, teachers and learners and anybody who presents, really. Um, and we've got lots to show you. So I'll, what I'll do is then is I'll just, all those seconds run out, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Michael Conlon. I'm a transformation consultant for XMA um, and a Microsoft Innovative Education Expert. I'm part of that community. Um, and I'm joined here today by Stuart. Stuart, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much um, for joining us for this PowerPoint session webinar. Uh, my name is Stuart, as Michael was saying, and I'm a digital learning consultant with XMA. And yeah, as Michael was saying, looking forward to taking you through. Um, certainly, PowerPoint is one of those ones that's well established within education settings. And uh, as Michael was saying, it just, it's just that thing that we just tend to use almost every day and forget there's so much that you can do in it. There's such a depth of resources within it. Um, so looking forward to exploring that with you today and hopefully you'll get some takeaways and things. But yeah, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Yep, and so my goal at any um, presentation that we do or any any session I deliver is that you at least leave with one thing you didn't know before you came in. And I'm hoping that by the end of this session, you'll be able to leave at least with one thing that you'd like to try in your classroom or with PowerPoint in, in its totality. So I'll switch my uh, webcam off. And I'll show you the start of this presentation. Hopefully, Stuart will give me the nod that that's all working lovely. It's washing. Okay, so yep. um, I'll start from the beginning. It's a very good place to start, as Julie Andrews once sang. Um, so uh, this is a session on the creative and collaborative classroom with Microsoft PowerPoint, really taking a fresh look at it again about how it can be used in our classes to inspire uh, our young people to develop those collaboration skills and creativity skills that we know are so important. Um, and we know that there's there's really many gifts we'd like to bestow upon our young people. And surely one of them is, as we can see in the, you know, the seven C's that Microsoft um, look at and spend some time with their research on, um, we do want them to become good communicators. We want them to be able to talk confidently about themselves, what their ideas are, what they've learned, and what they've created, made, solved, or believe in, anything of those natures. So communication is a key part of their success in the future, alongside some of these other seven of the seven Cs about critical thinking, collaboration, citizenship. And Microsoft have been looking at, you know, some other things that are coming on stream in terms of the kind of C world, if you like. And that's about them developing an appreciation about caring, about culture, uh, coding, computational thinking, how they develop their curiosity, how they curate learning and curate resources, and as well as learning about how, how do I develop a career, a lifelong career for, my, for myself. Um, and that's really to do with just building students who have got 
uh, an understanding of risk taking, um, the ability to reflect, and the ability to understand how to develop relationships, especially in the world of of technology, where so much relationship building happens online um, these days, both in you know kind of social media platforms and also within webinars exactly like this. Um, and trying to make sure that, our, that the way we educate is meaningful for our young people, it's motivating them, and that it's made for for everyone. We know that the World Economic Forum, um, you know, they, they do that Future of Work and Jobs report that, that businesses and organisations chip into, and how they really value um, communication, collaboration, and creativity skills. Sorry, I'll go back one, uh, if that's at all possible. Yeah, those skills there. Um, and we know that presentations are really the lifeblood of businesses, and that you know there's an it's an engine in sales meetings, for example. And we talk about PowerPoint, I guess, the same way we talk about things like a, a Hoover. Uh, certainly up here in Scotland, you know, when you talk about I need to Hoover the carpet, you're actually talking about the brand, but the brand becomes the action or a generic term for something. You know, make us a PowerPoint really means could you do a presentation for us, please? Um, and we also talk about uh, I guess death by PowerPoint and the things you should and shouldn't do. And I know that you and, and I certainly have sat through some horrendous ones as teachers, um, I've been involved in seminars and stuff, you'll, you'll have seen some horrendous ones and you'll know all the pitfalls, but it's important that we keep going through these, especially with ourselves and our young people, because I wonder if some young people would ever have sat in my lessons and thought, that was a terrible presentation. Especially if it's got things like this on the screen, you know, the ever popular red and green combination, which is horrendous on the eyes. Why would you do that to people? Or something like this. I mean, it's nicely laid out and things, but the colours are not good for many of our learners um, and the way that they read and can see things. Um, this one is just I mean, something like this has got lots of pictures, so that will be stimulating, won't it? Well, no, it's, it's overstimulation there, isn't it? It's just too noisy, too visually noisy, and doesn't really. There's no focus as to what it is I'm supposed to be learning here. This one, well, uh, what do you say about that? <laughs> if you can put that on a slide deck and sh have it on the screen, but for what purpose? To let them know that that's that's there. And in many cases, presentations just have to get too much information in them. You know, something like this. Here's key facts about water you need to know. So I'm going to put. All of that on one slide, bullet pointed to death. Um, you know, it's too many. There's there's too much information there. There's a cognitive overload. We've got a picture there that's been stretched. It doesn't look good. Stylistically, it's not nice. Um, and young people are very responsive to the way things look. They're they're quite um, visually mature in many ways in terms of you know they know what looks good and 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 so do we of course. Um, but we can we can take something like that and we can think well how can I make um, an impression that delivers this learning and the information I want them to know, but without the cognitive overload and something that's a bit more appealing. Well, PowerPoint can do that for you. It's just that we need to keep sharpening and looking at our skills with there. So we could look at something, it's a very simple dual coding technique. There's an image, it actually comes from just a, one of the simple logos that um, PowerPoint has got built in, both online and offline, and just focused on that one piece of information. Every minute, 8,000 pounds of water is lost due to leaks and breakages. That's much more um, easy to access than just this wall of text. And for many of our you know, dyslexic learners and things, that, that's just too noisy. Um, again, something simple like this. Again, it's just using two um, icons pulled from Icon Pack that's in PowerPoint, and then just straight fact. Don't be afraid to use more slides to convey the information, because one at a time, and a nice, bold, easy to understand statement that you can pause and talk about, rather than here, where you've got all this, where is that bit about the 450 years of decomposition? Let's not do that. Um, you'll see image pixelation and font horrors. You know, <laughs> I call them font horrors. It's just when there's no consistency. And you know, companies like Microsoft and Apple, and, and the social media channels that young people use, the memes that they see, um, they're well they're well developed, they're stylistically very well developed, they're, they've got a balance, they've got a sense of themselves. Um, that's not what you've got on the screen right in front of you just now. You do have uh, Barry Chuckle, um, who I was a big fan of, you know, um, the Chuckle Brothers, uh, but enough about me. Um, but that's that's not good, is it? It doesn't, it doesn't show that, that any effort has been made on behalf of the young people that you're presenting to. And then we've got the overuse of animations and transitions and stuff like that. That can go, you can go crazy daft with these things, but it doesn't actually add anything apart from, you know, 
you can demonstrate that you have access to that animation toolkit. Um, less is more in, 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 in the world of presentation. Um, so when we talk about how children become uh, good communicators, you're a huge role model as a teacher. And indeed, if you're presenting in front of your, your, your staff too, if you're a leader, class teacher, um, you're a role model for how that's done, how presentations happen, how what do they look like? And with you being such a huge role model for young people and how to present, you you show how to engage people, you show how to surprise, to fascinate, to teach, um, to also to listen. Um, and we model those good presentation skills. Um, you know, who did they learn from? It's, it's, it's you. But watching good communicators doing communication, that's how they're going to develop their communication skills. And you're using the tool of PowerPoint to communicate. So if they if they see bad PowerPoint skills and they see that that's acceptable, um, that's what they will probably mirror in their own presentations that they deliver back to you. And we need to talk to children about that. Because um, no matter who they are, who they are and, or what role they're going to go into in the future, you, you just cannot escape it. Presentations will be part of your future. You will be asked to deliver a presentation at some point. Ones that persuade, ones that teach, ones that inspire. So we need to talk to our young people about the art of presentation and communications, what, what a good one looks like, what a rotten one looks like, help them to critique uh, presentations, let them see um, great ones on video and pick apart where it works, that sort of thing. And I'm pointing in the direction of a book uh, um, later on in this session, but um, this is from a book called Resonate, and it talks about presentations sitting somewhere between a report and stories. Reports inform, stories entertain, and reports are used to convey information, and they should be distributed. Reports are distributed, not presented. I mean, you can do a presentation about a report, but it's, it's not right to just duplicate what's in that report up in a bigger font size on the screen. And what's gone wrong is that people are starting to use or have been using presentations as reports. Um, you know, screeds of information that once it's been delivered, you can say, well, they have the information and they can learn it. I've, I can safely say I gave the information needed to learn, but did learning any, did learning happen? Um, my feeling is that you're, um, what happens in the classroom is about building relationships. Um, so what we need to do to enable that is to move back towards the storytelling side and tap into that creative storyteller that you are, that's unique to you. I mean, you know your subject. You don't need to have a screen tell you the information to impart to the young people about your subject. You and your audience is what's important and how you develop that relationship through storytelling and the way you tell them. You know, Because if they're just reading things off a screen, like some of those bad slides I've shown you before, what does that communicate to your learners? Probably that you maybe have you're not as passionate about that particular piece of learning than, than than what's needed. And in fact, some of those slides might not even be made by you, maybe someone else. Um, and of course, it's not PowerPoint's fault. Um, it does have all the tools, but I know I am guilty of of just relying on the same old tools I've been using on for for many years. Um, we want to show you some tools here which are going to help your learners and help you tell your stories in different ways. Um, we think it's got all the tools you need to develop that mastery of storytelling, um, make your story much more easier to tell. We know that it can help develop those collaboration, communication and creativity skills that we were talking about just, just a little bit earlier. So I'm going to pass over to, um, I'll come out here, I'm going to pass over to Stuart, who's going to lead us on a session on the creativity part of, of this. So I'm going to change presenter to... Stuart, that should be you, Stuart. Grand, thank you very much. I'll just get my screen up here. Can you see that all okay? Yep, that's fine. Great. Smashing, thank you very much. Again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stuart, and I'm going to be taking you through this creative classroom process, and we're going to delve a little bit deeper uh, into the things that you can do um, with PowerPoint. Some of the things you might have seen maybe during the remote um, lockdown session and what some people are getting up to. Uh, and then what I felt um, kind of slid away as we came back into um, actual class as well. Um, 
need to kind of remember, and that's the message coming out of this webinar, is that this is more than just a presentation tool. And it has grown PowerPoint through the years. Um, and we've got kind of stuck into this norm when we get used to using a, a program or an app, um, that we don't explore all of the functionality of it. And certainly the things that have been updated to PowerPoint uh, are huge, uh, vast, and make that learning process uh, a lot more adaptable. Let's take a wee look um, at something that's maybe a little popular um, during lockdown, and that was creating a digital class. So what I'll do is I'll show a wee demonstration um, of this, explain a wee bit about what it is, maybe why you'd like to use it, and then I'll give you some wee starters for a hint for creating your own interactive digital classroom. So here I've built uh, my own digital classroom for my students. I'm going to direct a task to the students, all done in PowerPoint with about six slides roughly, um, and allowing students to collaborate on a task and just do it that little bit creatively. Let's take a little look at it then. Good afternoon and welcome to today's lesson, looking at Romeo and Juliet. Have a wee explore around the classroom and see what objects you can find to finish off your tasks. Some of these are within your study groups and some are for your own individual use. I'll see you at the end of the lesson. Have fun and carry them out in any order you wish. If you get a wee bit stuck, why not try and find the checklist, which will keep you on track. Enjoy. So what all I've done here is created a presentation that students can work through various tasks and that gives me more time to <laughs> sit about and drink my tea, of course. Uh, this is quite nice because what I've got ordered around the classroom are various clickable objects. Um, some maybe are a wee bit more hidden than others, but hiding behind these um, are certain tasks that I maybe want my students to take part in. So if I was to open up the envelope here for talking sake, and just clicking on the envelope, uh, gives the students a little task that they can maybe uh, perform within their stu um, study group. If I go back to my classroom, um, we can see a picture, for instance, on the desk um, of Romeo and Juliet. Clicking on this, again, gives tasks for the students. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? What were Romeo and Juliet <laughs> thinking uh, at the end of the play? And having the students maybe add in uh, a little bit of characterization, delving into um, a little bit about maybe how that character feels and just putting on their shoes, as it were. You can see around the class as well, I've embedded videos, maybe direction from myself, or on the little laptop here, I've got some study notes um, from Sparknote. Romeo and Juliet takes place in Verona, Italy. Two of the most important families in that city, the Montagues and the Capulets, have a long... Every time I see that, I want to break into song. If I thought that was a wee bit um, too um, small, I can just click on it and it will open through and allow me to view to the YouTube video where I could continue um, to watch and gather on. So all of these are all clickable. I either just take you to another slide, for instance, uh, the checklist here. All I'm doing is embedding a link, which takes me through to a slide. And again, this checklist, again, all made in PowerPoint can come back to the classroom, or uh, I can embed and link some of these objects to websites, whether it be uh, a YouTube link or maybe a Kahoot quiz. When opened up, the students can guide themselves around the classroom and take part in these uh, activities as and when it's needed. Let's close that one down just now. And this was really popular, like I said, um, during that kind of remote style learning where teachers wanted to get back into the classroom somehow. And it's funny how it kind of fell away a little bit as we went back into schools and classrooms. Well, why? This here um, is a way that you can build a lesson, have that lesson um, distributed to the students, and the students can go through it at their own pace. They can choose the tasks that they want to participate in, carry it out in a certain order, and once you save this classroom, you can update it, you can add different slides to it, you can add different embeds. It could be um, to show maybe a knowledge of a topic, to show a summary, to uh, explore maybe a new experiment or a science topic. So many endless ways that you can use this. And although it looks um, quite complicated, it is actually fairly easy. What I'm going to do then is I'll come out and I'll do a very, very quick um, guide 
to setting up and creating your own virtual interactive classroom. So all I've got here is a new presentation that's open. And the really nice thing um, about PowerPoint is the ability to add uh, and explore right from within the app. I don't have to go uh, onto Bing and search for maybe certain pictures. I can do this all from the app. If I go into the insert and the pictures slide here, I've got the ability to insert pictures that are already online. And again, these have been updated since I was at school. And we forget that these are here. There's some beautifully um, high definition style pictures. You can select various backgrounds if uh, all you were doing was building maybe a presentation or trying to explore um, some maybe topics as well. But in this case, because I'm building a classroom, I'm going to just search for a classroom. And again, I could drop any of these pictures in just as my backdrop. I'll find the one um, that I used for my actual example. Just down a wee bit. But when you're happy with it and you've found an image that you like, so again, just pinch this from PowerPoint itself. I can search for it, click, and insert. When this image is inserted, I can then just drag around until it's the correct size. And sit in the way that I want it to sit. Maybe a wee skew, we don't want people sliding out of the classroom there, do we? And I'll just get rid of my little title there. Okay, so now I've got my classroom, we can populate it with objects as well. So we've seen that I had maybe boxes um, and checklists, etc., that was in my classroom. At this point, I'm going to insert my pictures again. And a nice little feature from this when we go to insert pictures is that if you search for transparent, so let's go for maybe a transparent box. It means that if I was to draw these images in, I don't get that annoying white border around it. And it drops this in really nicely. And I could maybe set this box uh, on a table over here. Uh, let's go for a uh, transparent, let's go for an envelope. So, and all I'm doing is popping these objects around the classroom, and later on I'm going to embed links to them so that when a student clicks on them or taps on them, it will take them to a certain place. Let's go one more, uh, let's try, let's go for a laptop. And let's just choose this one, and that's it. So again, that transparent, popping it at the beginning before we search for the name. And get rid of the text. And again, we could resize, change the position, just so that it looks like it's sitting around the class. So I've started with my basis of my classroom. Now I can link it to um, certain slides, maybe. So if I inserted a new slide and I had um, maybe information that I want a task, be carried out in here. So maybe guidance, etc. If I go back to my classroom, I can link some of these objects to that slide by right-clicking on them, for instance, the envelope, linking to my second slide. That means if I go into my presenter mode here and I click on my envelope, it takes me to the slide that I've created. You can do this with a whole host of objects around your classroom or quizzes, etc. Another nice little feature is the ability to embed videos straight to your presentation. If you've got a video that you'd like to insert, again, we've got insert here, and I can insert a video. I could upload and adjust, maybe put myself in a projector. Or, like the study note that we had, if I go back to my YouTube video here of my Spark Notes. Romeo and Juliet. I can copy the link, head back to my classroom, and this time when I go to my video, I can insert an online film and it'll drop that video of the Spartan Notes Romeo and Juliet straight in. Again, I could resize this, um, I could make it look as if it was on the little smart board here. 
or I could resize it right down like I did in the first one and pop it in the laptop so that it plays around um, as and when. And again, if I was to save this, all I would then have to do is could keep the objects and change maybe the slides that they link to, change maybe the videos uh, that they link to. If I wanted to, I could record myself and have a wee explanation of the task that's going ahead. And this is a great way, like I said, um, to showcase knowledge. This is a really fun way that students can explore maybe a topic, or why not flip the learning? If a student has maybe taken part in Romeo and Juliet, get them to showcase it. Give them the guidance, maybe what would Einstein's classroom look like? And this year is a lesson in itself. Do you know how to build up, how to embed links, how to link to um, certain websites, certain videos, and then give the onus back to the student. Okay, let's have a look at a scientist's, um, maybe Neil Armstrong, what would his class look like, and all the clickable things. And instantly you could have that creative process, uh, but very, but very easily, just some wee buzzwords to get them going. I'm going to come away from this now um, and show you a couple of other things that you can do to enhance uh, your presentation skills. So I'll come out and I'll just open up another new blank presentation here. And the next thing I want to show you um, is this thing called design ideas. As Michael was saying, um, a lot of time and effort is spent sometimes on how a presentation looks. Um, and I mean, if you were to weigh up maybe the time spent researching and putting in the content versus how does this actually look, a lot of the time um, the presentation looks as heavily more weighted. Well, why? You're wanting them to come away, you're wanting your students, you're wanting your audience to come away learning something. PowerPoint allows um, that kind of stress, that worry, that hassle to be taken away and it allows you to get on with your task. So let's take a look at what I'm talking about then. If I was to go for, uh, let's say, um, the desert, for instance. Now, I could go and try and research and find a picture of a desert, etc., play about with the design of this until I'm happy with it. But Design Ideas uses a little bit of AI. It recognises the things that I'm talking about, and by clicking on Design Ideas, it gives me some step for hints for different title slides that I could use to make a really eye-catching start to my presentation. We've got ones that even play little presentations from the back of them. And the nice thing about it as well is that it is, it recognises um, the things that I'm trying to talk about and it will search and try uh, and up-level and build for that content. For instance, if I go to the ocean now, uh, and I try my design ideas, we can see that it started switching away from the desert and it's starting to give me some different ideas that I could use for maybe an ocean topic. Another nice feature within this design ideas, let's just insert um, a new blank slide um, from this one. And again, let's go back and find some nice eye-catching pictures. Maybe uh, we're doing something along with dolphins, for instance. So let's search our online pictures. Don't need to leave the app for a dolphin. And let's just pick one, two, and the first three images to insert. Now again, I could maybe spend a bit of time um, playing around with the size of these, making sure that they sit uh, in the right place, um, spending a lot of time maybe figuring out well which one do I want to um, can I be the most prevalent within these ones? Obviously helps if you've got a fast internet connection for downloading these images as well. But eventually it's came down and you can see now on the right hand side, design ideas, it started letting me know, well, that looks a wee bit naff. Why not change the way these pictures are set out? And again, really effortlessly, really easily, changes the way that you can present and showcase images to make it stand out and how long did that take a couple of seconds a couple of minutes depending on your internet <laughs> connection that's allowed really effective uh, and a really nice way that you can improve and enhance a presentation last wee thing to show you then is the collaborative process that you can do within powerpoint and looking a little bit at how you can collaborate with others and the way that you can work 
this could be student to student, this could be colleague to colleague, the ways that you can invite um, someone to share and work on slides with you uh, side by side. And again, this could happen remotely as well. In this instance, uh, what I've got here is maybe two students who are starting to research the Egyptians. They've decided that um, these two students are going to take on various parts and they're going to work on um, different slides and populate these slides independently. Now, in the past, what would happen, you'd maybe have two students sitting on the same computer, they'd be jostling over the mouse, you'd maybe have uh, one student would start the presentation, email it to um, their, their partner, they would work on it, email it back, backwards and forwards, and I bet that still happens. I can guarantee it in some establishments that's still the way. Well, why? Within PowerPoint, you can share directly and work um, collegiately very easily. At the top right-hand corner here, we can see the share button. Tapping on that, oh, I have to pause the video there, and it closed it down. I'll apologise, and I'll try and just open that back up again there. Oh, where's it going? Bring it back up. If we go up to the share button up at the top right hand corner there, the first thing it's going to ask me to do is to save this and save the copy to my OneDrive storage because that's the one that my establishment tends to use. So first and foremost, I am saving this up at my OneDrive. Once I've saved on it, it means that I can then share this out to maybe colleagues or students within my establishment. I can choose to send a copy at the bottom there. So maybe if I was doing my interactive classroom, I would send a copy out to everyone that I'd like to play around with and they can change it themselves. I could copy a link or email directly. Or if I knew the email address, I could just tap it in and send. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to send this out to a pupil who I want to join in and participate. That link to the PowerPoint has been sent out to um, that pupil. And if I just wait patiently, what we'll notice is a name will appear in pink, letting me know that my colleague has joined. Mrs. Cook is here in the classroom. You'll notice now over at the left hand side, a little pink dot is jumping about. That's as my collaboration and my partner is looking through the slides, understanding the things that I've worked on, some of the topics. I'm considering and my partner is going to start on the Pharaoh slide and begin to populate. This means that I can begin on the geography and this live change can happen. I can work on one slide, my colleague can work on another. Whilst I am populating the geography, maybe with some more online pictures, you can see at the left hand side uh, the colleague or the pupil or partner is busy working on theirs as well, putting in their own pictures, I'm working through at their own pace. Any changes that are made, I can see. I can see the parts that my partner is working on. And the nice thing as well is that any changes are made by my partner means that I can go in, um, if there's parts to it that I think maybe would look nicer or look a bit better, I could give a little hand. So if I go to the left-hand side and click on the slide, there's those design ideas at the right-hand side. I can see that my partner is in the slide with me and I can tap to change the design and how it looks. I could also live chat with my colleague. If I down at the bottom, click on notes, I could write and type a note to my partner and we could use this a little bit like a live chat box. Yes, we could use this as notes um, for our actual presentation, which is good. This is kind of a nifty wee trick just to have a live chat on the go. My partner can see that I've asked um, for maybe more images to be popped on this slide. They'll be reading it, reply, and in their own time, finding some images that they want to pop on, maybe about the pharaohs, and inserting them. And there it goes there. And within those notes, if I just scroll down, I can see that I've actually got a reply, and life changes can happen. So a great way to collaborate with um, student to student, from colleague to colleague. Live changes can happen all within the same app, 
and the ability to change up level and enhance presentations uh, is so easy. And the changes that have happened within PowerPoint uh, have just vastly improved and enhanced the classroom experience, making it more creative and collaborative. Hopefully you got some wee takeaways um, from that wee demonstration there. And I'll pass you back uh, to Michael, hopefully, who will just take the slides back off of me and take you to the next part. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that's great, Stuart. Thank you. Um, and of course, Stuart was using the desktop version. I think she has this is on a Mac, this is mine, but it's the same. Yeah. And the same thing you can get on the um, PC version, obviously. Um, I'm going to do something within the browser version of PowerPoint here, as you can see. I and that's how I led the, this you presentation. Is all. It's just your microphone, just to switch on, um, and then it'll be back to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, Stuart? Stuart, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? <laughs> you now. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Good. Thank you. So yeah, thank you. I'm on the 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 um the cloud version um, of C65 PowerPoint. It looks very similar to our, our full package. I'll show you something in the full package that we can't do on the on the on the on the, the browser version just yet. I know Microsoft are busy ferreting away doing some stuff but in the background. Um, but one of the things we wanted to show you was ways in which we can support um, your learners um, to, to engage better within a, within a presentation as you're giving it. And if I go to the slideshow option um, in my presentation, there's a couple of new buttons that you might not have seen before. Uh, one is present live. And the other one is always use subtitles. And then there's another one called rehearse with coach. And I'm going to go through each one of those. So if I switch on always use use subtitles, it means that when I start to present, you will see subtitles at the bottom of the screen as I'm presenting here. And I've decided it's going to be below the slide. I get an option for the spoken language, which is English, and then a subtitle language, which I've got as English at the moment too. So let's just try it. Let's try and present uh, with always use subtitles and from the beginning. And hopefully what you'll be able to see at the bottom of the screen is that when I speak, immediately the software picks that up and makes the titles for me, which is fabulous. I want to change that now. I want to change it from English to, um, let's go to, I don't know, finish. Should we go finish? Let's give that a go. So that now, if someone in my class has got that language um, and that's their, maybe their first language, then perhaps when I start my presentation, then what will happen is as I give the presentation, the language that they are working in, finish, will appear at the bottom of the screen, which is incredibly helpful for that young person and supports their learning within your classroom. And that's really what we want to achieve, isn't it? That it happens within the classroom, that they've got that support there as you're demonstrating it. So that's the always use subtitles option available both within the, the, the browser version and the full fat version on a desktop. Um, there's the other option here called present live. Now present live is really, really interesting because it means that anyone can watch your presentation no matter where they are in the world. And they don't have to have um, Microsoft Office, they just need to have a browser. And I'm going to show you how you can do that. This is really, really useful when you think about remote learning opportunities um, and connecting with other schools from across the world. A uh, really popular option just now. So present live. Um, to present live, I'm going to switch it to be anyone. Okay. So I'm presenting this presentation to anyone in the world. I'm also going to go to, I'm going to show you my um, little phone here to show you that I'm going to do this with a phone. So I'm going to watch this presentation by phone. So when I click on present live, what will appear on the screen is a QR code so that anyone with a link can join that session. And so I'm just going to use my phone just now to capture that QR code and then open up that um, the slide deck. So I'm joining with that slide deck. I'm going to click on show slides now. And here is my presentation that I'm giving to my class. I'm still on finish, 
at the bottom, of course, because I didn't switch that back to English. And that's okay, because if we actually, um, if I go to my phone here, can you see that I have, I've got my phone, I can see the slide deck, and I've chosen my language on my phone. So if I change my language, not to finish, which it currently is on the screen, if I change that to French, because perhaps I am French, what it'll do is it'll convert all the previous chat that's been going on as I've been given the presentation, but also in the language of my choice, which means that as I give a presentation, if everybody's got their own device and we're using PowerPoint Live, every child in your classroom could have the language setting for them set. Um, so it's specific and pertinent to them. And that's unbelievable. And many of the one-to-one -one programs we have across um, local authorities in, in Scotland that the XMA work on and have developed, this is the kind of thing which really empowers young people. Um, the children with English, additional language, all that sort of thing. Uh, on my phone, I can, well, in fact, do you know what I'll do? First of all, I'll do the old day. Get back to the presentation, uh, which is here. Uh, no, it's not. I've lost the presentation already. Um, oh, that's because it's on a different screen. So here is the here's the presentation I'm giving, and if I skip through my um, slides all the way through down to here, etc. If I show you um, back on my phone. My phone is at the right slide, but what I can do as the, the person on the phone, I can actually walk back to previous slides. And this is not something you would normally be able to do um, if a teacher is giving a presentation. You'll, you'll have sat in meetings like I have where you think, could you just go back to that slide, please? I didn't quite catch that. Um, but with PowerPoint Live, you've got some control here. You can actually move back a slide. I missed that fabulous picture. And so you can jump through the slides as, but you can only do it up to the slide that the presenter has got to. So I can look at all the previous 24 slides. If I want to go back to the current slide that the, the presenter is onto, I just tap on color current slide on my phone and it takes me to where they are. I can't go beyond that, but I can go all the way back to how that started. Um, so we can change the language. We can give some feedback here with little emojis, et cetera, little thumbs ups little laughs, etc. a really interactive way that, that I know a lot of our young people like to, to do um, on their phones. And so if I just go back here, uh, back to this. So PowerPoint Live is incredibly powerful. It means that the community that we share with can be much, much broader and all of the world on an any device that's got a browser um, without having to install any apps and things like that. So that's 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 just a fantastic opportunity for our students to, to, to be involved in. Okay, let me come out of that. Um, I've come out of the presentation, but it hasn't ended yet. I could give the students some more time to go through um, skipping backwards and forwards through slides on their device. But once I'm ready to end the session, I'm going to click on end session, click on the end session button, and now if I go back to that phone, you will see that that presentation has been ended for the students. They can't do any more with it. Um, they can give it a rating, so they can give it um, a score at a five, and then they can tell you more. So if I thought the slide design was immense, speaker skill was okay, the content was okay, interaction with the audience was kind of okay. And I can then submit that to the presenter, and I as a presenter get an email um, to tell me what the feedback was about that session. Now that's good for, for you as a teacher, but it's also good for them if they're giving presentations that they get to see what the feedback from their audience is, is like. I think that's just fantastic. So we had th those two things there, present live and always use um, subtitles and you can choose the language you're speaking in and the language of the subtitling. Really powerful stuff. If I go to rehearse with coach, this is really good for you determining and building your, your, your presentation skills, both you personally and also for young people. Um, you know, they do say that if you want to give an effective presentation, if you look at any of the TED talks that happen um, all over the world, these people have rehearsed for tens and dozens and sometimes hundreds of hours for that 20 minute slot. Um, and young people can get some feedback by choosing rehearse with coach. When I do that, um, you'll see that there's a button in the bottom right hand corner. Welcome to the PowerPoint presenter coach. 
you'll get some feedback. So when I start rehearsing, it will start listening to my voice. It'll know the content of what's on the screen. It'll know how fast or slow I'm moving through the slides. It will pick up if I'm doing a kind of um, a, a mumbling, maybe, I don't know, maybe not speaking loud enough. And can you see it's telling me at the bottom, try not to use too many fillers like, um, and if I speak too fast and I get too quickly and I'm remembering I lost, try not to use too many fillers, etc. And as I can move through my slides, it'll be recording and listening to me constantly about what it is I'm doing. And when I get to the end of my presentation, I'm just going to escape just now. What I'll get is a rehearsal report. And there's something like 34 seconds isn't enough to capture enough data um, because you can see the pace was just right and that probably wasn't right for most of that. But look what you're getting. You're getting about getting information about, well, you chose to avoid reading slide text out loud, which we know is as a major sin that we've seen in lots of pre presentations um, using inclusive speech, the pitch of your voice, um, your average pace over time. Um, I think those are really, really interesting ways of having conversations with young people about what presentations actually look like. You're collaborating with them about the, those skills that they were needing to them to develop over time using um, communication tools like PowerPoint. And then once they've rehearsed, they can rehearse again and get another report. And that can be really powerful and helpful for them. Okay, so those features were really all about the presentation part of it and the additional benefits to some of our learners um, in terms of the, the, the captions at the bottom and the present live. Uh, I'm going to go into the, the PowerPoint desktop version just now and show you some really creative options here. Um, I'm looking to build a presentation all around uh, heroes and villains. So I want to have some pictures of heroes and villains, and that's absolutely fine. I can go ahead and do that. And I can go to the insert menu, and I can go to the pictures option here in the top left-hand corner. And I know that uh, we spoke earlier about um, online pictures, but there is also stock images now that have appeared um, from um, Microsoft, which is a great option. Lots of stock pictures you see are you know, paid, that you have to pay for them um, online. But they've got a whole bank of them, stock images. So if you were wanting to go to, I don't know, what if you were looking for travels? And there's a lovely picture of a balloon, lovely, nice stock image. And you can see that it's, it's jumped onto that uh, designer view again, because it's also always trying to help you all the time, which is what I really like about it. And it's not obtrusive, you know. Um, so I, I'm going to use just drawings, um, or sorry, pictures that I'm going to get from online. And I'm looking for um, a guy called Thanos, who you'll remember from um, the Marvel films, I hope. So here is Thanos. I'm going to grab a picture of him. Um, let's go for this one here. Here's Thanos. Now, there's lots of stuff in this picture I don't actually want. I don't want all of this stuff. You know, and I, I don't like images being square on on pictures, and it's an aesthetic thing that the, the reason why I don't like that because it's taken up a lot of space. What I really want them to focus on is the character, and not the the, the you know the rocks behind it, etc. Like, like that. Let me just zoom in here a little bit um, and get up to a big, bigger size. So I'm going to show you where we can we can use one of the features of picture formatting. So if I choose picture format at the top here, over on the left hand side we have remove background, which is a really powerful feature. When I click on it, remove background, it will try and use some of its artificial intelligence to figure out, right, it probably just wants the head. Um, but we can see in the preview over here that that's not really what I want. I want the, the body and the hands. So I have options to mark areas to keep. So if I click on that, I get access to a pencil. And all I have to do, as it says, is could you mark those bits you want to keep, please? And it gives me that bit of the forehead. There's a little bit more I want of that forehead. Thank you very much. There is the hand. I'm going to kind of draw lines down the fingers because um, I definitely want that finger. And that, and that, and this. Oh, And you can see sometimes as I do things, it connects it to other parts of the, the picture. I definitely want that bit and I want his shoulder, please. Thank you very much. There's a little bit here that's missing. 
and a bit of his ring. Okay, and a bit of his face. We don't want his half of his face to be missing. That would be, that wouldn't be great, would it? Um, so let me click away from it, and it'll, it'll show me what it's left me with. Okay, but I can go back. I can click back on it. I can go back to remove background, and I can see that this bit is still needing to be added. Okay, that's the black bit. There's this little bit of his hand, which we'll pick up, um, and then let's see where that leaves us. And now I've got an object with that background removed, and I can resize that. I can move it down to the place that I want, and aesthetically, that looks much better, doesn't it? Um, you can, if you search for, um, not stock pictures, but online images, if I was to look for Iron Man, um, if you'd chosen transparent Iron Man, you may well have found one which was already transparent, because PowerPoint know that you're looking for images that sometimes don't have that surrounding area. Um, so let me choose this one, and I'll insert that here. It's already got the transparency behind it anyway, so you don't have to worry about that back, black back, that, that background. Um, all images will come with acknowledgements for the author, um, but you can take that away unless it's um, something that you have to be required to do. So there is two images I have here, and I want to have this um, presentation is all about heroes and villains. So if I go to insert a text box and type it in here, and it's about heroes and villains, and fonts are very important, and if you get the option to have and put in new fonts. I'd suggest you do so. Um, if you can download font packs to your to your uh, device, that can really help an awful lot. I've got a really nice one called here called Hulk Smash, and I'll change that size to maybe 96. Um, oh, I'll move it to Heroes and Villains, like so. I'll change the colour to white, and I'll move it to maybe that kind of size, and I'll centre it. Okay, so that's my 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 um, first image. Now, what I'm going to do, strangely enough, here is I'm going to right-click on this first slide. I'm going to choose duplicate because I want to show you something called morph. In this second slide, I'm going to remove this text and I'm going to resize this guy. I'm going to make this guy smaller. Like so. Now I'm going to choose a transition for this slide from the transitions pane called Morph. And Morph is an amazing feature. Can you see what it's just done there? Giving you a little preview. Um, if I do this slideshow, uh, I'll go back to the beginning. Uh, the Morph will decide where did this slide start and where did the objects end up at the end of it. And then it calculates what it needs to do to that image to move it into that new position. So if I was to do the same again here, if I duplicate that slide here, and then I resize this, and I resize this, then what we get across the three slides, and it's also copy that morph feature in when you duplicate it, and um, what I get across the three slides is this. I get the morphing into this, and then the morphing into this. And isn't that so much more impressive as a as a way of communicating your ideas with young people than just jumping to another slide? This is really really so easy, and I, I'm all a big fan of um, of simplicity. And so, what I would encourage you to do is is use very few transitions, and morph is one of the perfect things, one of the most perfect things you can do. I want to finish up by looking quickly at um, if I go to the insert menu, I've got something called 3D models, and in 3D models. I get lots of moving models and 3D models that you can use as part of your lesson across lots and lots of topics. If I go to the um, all animated models here and choose, I've got one that's for the heart, and I'm going to choose insert. And again, with internet access, here it comes down. And there we have a 3D rotatable heart image and I'm using my mouse for this and you can be using this to be explaining concepts within your classroom using this 3D model and moving it about and what's nice is that if I was to duplicate this slide 
and then just move that a small amount. And then if I duplicate it again, and perhaps I could take the 3D model and I could make it a little bit bigger and also rotate it a little bit, like so. If I watch from here, you'll see my 3D model beating on the screen. And when I move on to my next slide, it'll turn the way I want it to turn before it continues to animate. And then again, get in closer and begin to animate. So using these, you know, really, really nice tools, I can end up with a really engaging, creative, professional looking um, slide deck that I've built just from the tools which sit within PowerPoint. I don't have to leave the app to go anywhere to get anything exciting because it's all here within the toolbox that I've been given. Okay. What I'd like to do is I'd like to finish off um, here. We've shown you quite a number of, of different things. Um, I'm going to actually show you just quickly but from insert with the icons. Um, there's, there's thousands of icons available to you. So one of the ones I had was, was oil there in one of the previous slides, and I can insert that and move it, resize it. And icon-based um, geocoding is really, really powerful, actually, um, if you look at some of the research. I'll finish off just by talking about um, where some of the ideas um, that you can Excuse me, I'll get to the right slide, uh, which is here. Uh, yeah, this is, these are, if you're looking for really interesting presentations um, and about people who've got real power to tell stories, here are three of my favourites. I've got Benjamin. Uh, Excuse me, Benjamin Zander, um, Sir Ken Robinson sadly departed, and Rita Pearson also sadly gone from the education sphere. I, I would really urge you to look at TED for some of these great educationalists and see how they present um, in only 20 minutes. Um, I've also used a couple of books um, from Nancy Duarte, Resonate, and Slideology, which really talk about the art of giving presentations and how to build, you know, powerful stories that really convince and then you know and, and enthrall and engage and teach people um, if you're wanting to explore more about powerpoint and the entire microsoft office 365 suite then please as a teacher go ahead and go to the educational uh, education.microsoft.com and look at the microsoft educator community there's a whole host of courses and features there that which will really really empower you as a professional um, and if you want to contact XMA again and talk about how we can support you in a school's journey on a professional learning journey, then we're there to do that for you. And our details are on the screen. Give us a phone or, you know, give us an email or check us out online at We Are XMA and at XMA Learning. And if you're doing Finnish, you you know, if you know Finnish, hopefully that will make sense at the bottom too. Um, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of, of Stuart and myself, and if Stuart wants to jump back on, um, I'd just like to thank you for your attendance um, and spending some time with us this afternoon. I know you're all very, very busy people. I um, hope you take something from that. Um, you will get a recording back um, from the uh, the session. We XME will email that to you. We'll also be promoting that on our Twitter feed and on LinkedIn. But for, for, for now, and until the next one, thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Take care now. Okay, take care. Stay safe. Bye.